Uh, I want to thank all of you for all the crazy, amazing things that you're doing with technology, uh, with innovation, because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have this conference and we wouldn't have some of the wonderful things that are coming to the world. Uh, I also want to thank the program committee, O'Reilly, uh, John Bruner, Joy Ito, and the team that puts on this conference, because I think it's a wonderful conference that's really going to help define the future. And today I want to talk about what I call frictionless frameworks. Uh, it's sort of an extension of a little bit of uh, the ideas I brought up last year. And really, what I'm all about right now is asking this question uh, of what if. What if you could tell which technologies were the ones that were going to change the world? Well, if I could answer that question accurately, that would make me very popular amongst CEOs and venture capitalists. I probably would have a much better job right now than I do. Um, because if you could be as methodical as possible about deciding where and how to invest your money, your resources, your time, if you could increase the odds that you've pointed your business in the right direction and you're making the right decisions, that would be extremely valuable. The problem is that this is predictive and not prescriptive. And really, at the level of technologists, we want to be able to, there we go, prescribe change, drive change, especially in the fast-moving technology spaces like the ones that we discuss here at Solid, it's very important that we can prescribe the future and define what the future means. And that's a design problem. It's not a prediction problem. So if we want to define something, we want to be able to define and control the parameters that will give us the most significant value creation. The issue here is that we can't control what we can't understand. So last year, being a biomechanical engineer, I brought up lots of biology. And a lot of the analogies, a lot of the ideas that I had were ideas that came to me through assessing these systems, these complex uh, systems in a biological context. And it's great to see a lot more biology here this year. Because biology tells us that if you look at a system at the micro scale, and then you zoom way out to the high levels, what you see and the behaviors and the characteristics of that system are a conglomerate of the behaviors of that micro scale, but they look very, very different. And I call this effect the scaling discontinuity. Because what it means is that when you look at complex systems, if you zoom in and take any small node and understand that node and then zoom way out, there's an inherent break in the behaviors of those systems at the high level compared to what you see at the low level. So these systems are not fractal systems. They're totally unrecognizable between the two scales, <clears throat> which unfortunately for those of you who don't like thermodynamics leads me to another idea, this idea of a thermodynamic phase change where in terms of economic theory, moribund industries are forced to quickly figure out how to stay relevant when new technologies are driving old business models away. Old ways of doing things go, die, and the businesses that adhere to those old ways go with them. So the idea of calling this conference solid is much more meaningful to me now than it was a year ago. Because when we generate a phase change that causes, say, a chaotic liquid or gas to change into a solid, we unleash tremendous potential energy. In business terms, this is where the big economic value comes from. So last year, I got you all hooked up with biology, and there's lots of biology here at Solid. This year, I'm going to talk a little bit about thermodynamics. I won't predict what will happen if I do that, um, but you might want to start studying thermo a little bit. <clears throat> Enough for the theory for a moment. Um, you can catch me later, and I'll talk your ear off about economic theory. What does this mean for you as designers, as innovators, as funders, as leaders? How can you take the messages that I'm sending home to your companies and change the way you do business? Well, what's interesting about scaling discontinuities is they break down into two components that I think are the critical components. One of those components is something that we kind of understand already, which is networked ecosystems. The fundamental characteristic of a, of a marketplace that defines the rate and the spread of new technology through that market 
is described by the network effect of that ecosystem. <clears throat> and what I'm going to focus on here is the frictionless framework aspect, because it is the second component that gives us here in this room our superpowers. Frictionless frameworks are catalysts. They reduce the energy that it takes to disrupt a market. They are the nascent points where phase change occurs. You can consider them nucleation sites. <clears throat> and frictionless frameworks are also fundamental to what it means to be human. Since the beginning of time, we've designed frictionless frameworks, tools and processes that give us more efficient, ener uh, more energetic and more efficient interactions with our environment. And there's something fundamental in the way humans design and use tools. It stays with us even as technology changes. So as Moore's law marches us steadily into the future, what we have to understand is the best tools are the ones that pay deep respect to what it means to be human and what it means to be creative. These are the tools that allow us to focus our ideas and work on ideas, work at the level of ideas instead of getting muddled in technology. These should be obvious concepts. So hopefully I'm connecting dots for you. But I've heard a lot of criticism about some of these tools because people say, well, that's fun. You're unleashing creativity. I mean, that's play. That's not innovation. <clears throat> if these tools are fun, they're not industrial strength. But the smart companies, the ones that are changing the world, are learning lessons demonstrated by these tools and by the best tool designers. Here I bring an example, MediaTek, which is a company that for a number of years was demolishing the competition in China in terms of selling silicon into smartphones. How are they doing it when companies like Intel Qualcomm had much better silicon, had much more functional, much more energy efficient products, ARM. What they did was they designed tools that allowed anyone at a phone company to create a new smartphone in 15 minutes. So you unbox the MediaTek toolkit, and at the level of the product designer, you say, this is what I want the phone to do. You plug in their toolkit, you flip some switches, you turn some knobs, and out comes a new cell phone. Now, obviously, I'm simplifying a little bit, but really, their toolkit was famous for allowing designers to create new products in the span of a 15-minute period. <clears throat> so the lesson here for big industry, if you do not want to get frozen out by the phase change that occurs when technology outpaces what's existent in the market today in terms of big business, the thing to do is to treat your customers like a consumer. Even if you're a business-to-business -business entity and your customers, you don't see them as consumers because they don't buy your product at Best Buy, treat them like a consumer. We learned this from the world of makers, that the good tools which reduce the time and the risk of developing new products, that makes each iteration of your product development cycle easier. So makers could now do what large corporations used to do with fewer risk, fewer resources, and less time. We saw this trend in the, software, the open source software movement. We saw this trend in the dot-com economy. These disruptive forces struck fear in the hearts of established industry. But industry does not have to be afraid what big industry has to do is raise the bar. The simple thing that you have to understand is that your customers have a choice. You can buy chips from MediaTek, you can buy chips from Intel. What choice are you gonna make? Well, ultimately, the question there comes down to what is the goal of your customers? They're trying to provide products and solutions to their customers with the least time, least cost, least risk. So, Consumer product design goals are rapidly becoming the strongest point of differentiation, even for industrial product development. Treat your customers like a consumer, even if they aren't a consumer. Where startups are all about risk, 
managers at big companies tend to fear risking uh, their jobs. But as risk decreases with good tools, corporate entrepreneurship becomes your imperative. So this should be obvious. Take the risk out of your products to win over new customers. And the way to do that is by making your products frictionless frameworks. So I'm going to give you four basic guidelines, four design rules for frictionless frameworks. These are the things that I want you to leave here from my talk with. Make your tools intuitive. Again, our humanity is tied to tools. We have millions of years of intuition developed with how we use tools. Give your tools low barrier for entry. Your children should be able to use the products that you develop. And if they can't, well, somebody else will develop the product that your children can use. And that's the product that I'm going to buy to develop my new technologies. Make your products accessible. Make it easy for a designer, somebody who's not thinking at the level of technology, but thinking at the level of the problem. Give them access to your tools and technology. And also make sure your tools have adequate headroom. You don't want somebody to start developing a new product with your tool and then say, oh, gee, it'd be great if it could do this, but we're really bumping against the limitation and capabilities of the product. And finally, I'm going to leave you with the two methods of assessing whether or not you're successful in following these design rules. The first is a concept that I call mean time to blink. How long does it take somebody when unboxing your product, how long does it take them to do something useful with your product? That is mean time to blink. It's a concept that I came up with, introduced to Texas Instruments, and it's permeated a lot of the internal product development that they do now. And then the final concept is called mean time to abandonment. Every technology will be abandoned. Is it going to be abandoned the moment I open up the box and I look at it and say, this is impossibly complex? Or there's another company with a better offering out there that is much easier to use? Or is it going to be abandoned 20 years later when new technologies subsume the old ones? That's where you want to be. The longer your mean time to abandonment is, the better. So I'll leave you with my final thought, which is a reiteration of the concept that Solid is not about disrupting economies of scale. We are about disrupting economies. Thank you very much.